Because I took it off. All right. Wait, say yes. What time are you heading out? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. You good here? Yeah. You tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Get out of my way. Yes, sir. All righty then. Thanks for making it out, everyone. Everyone awake? <coughs> good plan, good plan. All right, so we've got a couple announcements. T-shirts, come and get them. They're uh, a $15 cash donation to the EFF or the uh, Hackers for Charity. Get you the T-shirt of your choice. Uh, still have most of the sizes left. They have ladies and youth sizes as well. If you have not got something for your kids, get them a T-shirt. Uh, we have bags also. Uh, if you've been anywhere around a con, which I, I unfortunately know a fair amount about, you end up with a lot of stuff left over. So. Um, you sacrifice a lot of garage space, and I'm sure that Heidi and Bruce have a fair amount dedicated to bags and swag. So every year they'll sell the bags and uh, t-shirts and everything from the previous year. So if you didn't make it last year and you want one, or if you find them very useful, we have plenty of those for you. Uh, the money from those sales go to the EFF and the Hackers for Charity, so it goes to a good cause. Um, if you're here, you're missing out on Python for newbies. Um, <laughs> Scott, I'm sorry you lost out to a language. All right. So uh, they're doing that in the chill out area. It's from 11 to 1, so after you finish Scott's talk, uh, you'll have 10 minutes. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying you ever go over it all. Um, if you have any feedback, you can email it to feedback, uh, feedback at schmoocon.org or go to feedback, uh, feedback.schmoocon.org or send an email to info at schmoocon.org or heidi at schmoo.com. The general idea is if you've got something to say, good, bad, or indifferent, please go ahead and send it to one of those. Uh, you can go on the website and uh, uh, post your feedback, and they'll get that. Uh, are you okay? <laughs> You're enjoying that way You're too much. You're eating into my I know. 70 Shut slides. Up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so if you get a chance, visit the Hackers for Charity booth. They're uh, case full of leather stuff that they uh, made and shipped over here, got lost. They finally found it yesterday. So they've got some really nice stuff uh, at their booth. You'll stop in and check that out. And uh, after you get through with uh, sitting in Scott's talk, everything that you missed because he's moving so quick, uh, you can go and uh, get a DVD from Ted. He's got uh, DVDs of all of the talks from uh, Shmukon and, and previous conferences also. So um, Scott. Scott is the, the, a good friend of mine, and uh, I just want to say thank you for coming out and blessing us with yet another 70-slide deck. I don't want to say how much longer I can take up it. Anyway, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Scott Moulton. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm Scott Moulton, and I do forensics and data recovery. I run a company for the last 12 years or so that does both of those. So if you want to know more than just Google this, uh, I'm not going into any more of me. So uh, other than I teach a class, and I'll be here next month. How's that? Uh, <clears throat> so basically, this whole talk is about cameras and XFAT, which some people don't realize that there is a new replacement for SDHC cards, which is SDXC cards. And uh, pretty much since 2009, Microsoft has bought everything, so that's kind of the direction it's going. And most people don't realize that all of your cameras, all your future pictures, and most people don't believe me when I say it, you will be owned by Microsoft, are already owned by Microsoft, no matter what device you use to take photos. Isn't that amazing? Aren't we happy? Linux, Android, Windows, Mac, all cameras. And so that's what this is about, so we'll talk about that from that perspective. So they're getting a lot of money, actually, not just a little bit. So the first thing is, uh, so the whole way this whole thing started is, uh, and I want to give thanks to a friend named Zoran, who's in Australia, who helped me. I've gone to Australia a couple of times to teach a class. And because we're in the United States, sometimes we don't get all the equipment that other countries are getting as fast as they are getting it. So I went there to do a class, and, and he says, well, what are you doing with XFAT? And he goes, I said, nothing. Nobody's using that crap. So it's been around for forever, and nobody's using it. He's like, well... Every camera now has it in it, and they're being distributed to America and blah, blah, blah. So it started me down this path a year ago, looking at all this stuff. So part of the problem is, is that there is a unique set of code for XFAT to actually run. XFAT is not, is not even, even though it has the FAT name in it based on FAT32, it is a completely new derivative of a file system optimized for solid-state drives. So fundamentally, 
Uh, it's been around for a little while, and now it's in everything. So in the process of testing, because that was one of the first things I was looking at, well, what happens with these cameras? Very few places could I buy an SDXC card in America, so I had to go through a process a year ago of grabbing some. Now they're starting to be a little bit more prolific. But basically what you do is this is an SDXC card, and the way that you test is so that you can't buy every camera that's out there or know every piece of code that's running on them. That you, you basically take your stick and you go to a shop and every hole that you see, you stick your stick in. That's pretty much the way that works. So then you run tests on it. I got lucky enough that some camera shops actually let me bring in a laptop and sit there and look at content in hex from cameras as I was actually doing it. So Showcase in Atlanta let me do this. A couple of different places would let me actually look at the content and then try to describe to them what's actually happening because the code out there that's running on these cameras is crap. It is utter and complete crap. It's like they just pasted shit in there just to make it work just for today and nothing works. So, uh, so it's really bad. So anyway, so that's what we're looking at. All of these cards, anything above 32, Anything that's larger than 32 gigs, the camera will, and by default, according to the SD Card Association, be formatted as XFAT without a request from you or even any acknowledgement. So if you have a FAT32, if you were able to format it as FAT32 in a 64 gig card, put it in your camera, it will reformat it uh, or maybe not even use it because by definition it will not be usable. So I, before I kind of get into this, I have divided my talk into two pieces. One is the history, kind of the story of how this happened. And then I'm gonna get into like three areas of where I've seen some really weird stuff in SDXC cards, things that don't work. So this is my, I'm gonna travel down the history road to try to tell you a few things about how things have happened. So one of the first explanations I have to give you, which we will leverage a little bit later, is this hard drive, this is the disk you've been waiting for. So it is great, you know, for you know, $3,500, $3,400, uh, you get a 10 meg disc, and they had a 5 meg option for only $300 less, so it was really awesome. Uh, but one of the things I want to point out is back in 1982, when Microsoft's working with IBM to try to figure out how we're going to make a, an operating system slash uh, file system work on a disc, one of the things that happened is the, this disc uses an actuator arm that actually moves the head across the disc that writes data in a cylinder. And when I say a cylinder, what I mean is like this. The data physically will go down through all of the platters. So you have tracks, and the tracks will write data through the cylinder, and then that cylinder then would be where your data would be stored. Well, in this case, the problem was if you could write a partition anywhere, then you would have to turn on a head. Only one head can be on at a time. Even though there's a stack of heads, they are not reading and writing data at the same time. One head has to be on. If you want to go to another head, you turn it off. So you have to turn that head off. You have latency, then you have to search for something else. So one of the things that FDISCs, FDISC, the DOS program FDISC, uh, would do in order to format, one of the requirements was is a partition must begin on a cylinder boundary. And what that means is everywhere that there is a location where the cylinder begins, that would be where your partition had to begin so that there was a calculation. You could leave one head on and go all the way across the top of the platter and search for the beginning of your partition. So everybody understand this concept? That way you did not have to turn off any of the other heads and search for a partition. You could physically go across the disk and reach the beginning of your partition without having to seek any other locations and turn it off because it was really slow. I mean, as, as awesome as this, you know, 399, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is, uh, this is slow as dirt. So we stuck with this all the way through Vista. We still had this requirement all the way through Vista, and while no other, none of the other operating systems and file systems require it, many of them honor it just because of legacy and other concerns. But you will see this come back again and again and again. In 4K drives, in the new drives that are out there, the 4K sectors, there is an offset that actually causes a problem because of this old partition structure that had to be done. And this is coming back in SDXC cards, so we'll talk about that. Part of the reason that we have this problem with 64 gigs or anything larger than 32 gigs is because back in 2000, Microsoft says, okay, we have this new file system called NTFS, and NTFS, we are not going to allow uh, FAT32 any longer to be formatted larger than 32 gigs natively in our file system, in our operating system. So basically they turned off the ability to format anything that was a larger disk because the clusters, the way the cluster size was used, made it very cumbersome. It would use up a lot of space. And so because of the way that data is allocated, it physically would turn this off and not allow you to format anything larger than 32 gigs. And it has remained that way. 
It wasn't a big problem back then because it was fine to use NTFS or whatever other, you know, HFS or whatever other file system operating system you're using. And so this continued on through history. And so our problem is later on, as we're moving ahead, that we no longer had, uh, we have some items out there that will want to be formatted larger than 32 gigs that are a flash uh, solid state drive. Anybody, anybody remember what NTFS was called before it was? Was it? Well, that's what the name means, NTFS. What was it prior to that? What did it evolve from? I have a gift. Big ass disk. HPFS. Thank you. HPFS. High performance file system. It was OS2's platform, and Microsoft and IBM were in bed together, and then they got pissed off, and there's a whole story behind that, and then they went their own way, and they took HPFS, they made a couple of changes, minor changes to it, and then went in a new direction called NTFS. And so that's where that comes from. It was originally developed and started around 1985. So this file system has been around for a very long time, just like HFS. So when you're looking at a hier the hierarchical file system as well. So all of our current file systems are pretty old. Uh, and FAT, the new version of XFAT is, at least from a prolific standpoint, one of the only ones that's making it into everything else. So NTFS has a couple of things that are detrimental to solid state drives. The, one of the things is, is that as we have continued forward, your NTFS file system, along with your operating system, will now look at how often you open a file. And the way a drive is designed is the lowest LBA numbers are out here on the outside edge because that's the fastest location on the disk. Not because it's spinning faster, but because you don't have to turn off the head and move it to another platter or another location in order to read content. So you can leave it in one location and read content faster than you could anywhere else on the disk. So what happens is, in the process of, of looking at the content, our operating systems are now trying to say, okay, instead of running defrag or something like that at a periodic time, why don't we run performance items so we can see how often a file is being opened and we'll say the lowest number item will then make its way to the outside edge of the disk. So some things are reserved, including like the MFT entries and FAT tables are reserved towards the outside edge of the disk and they don't normally shuffle around towards the inside of the disk. So this is actually what will cause a lot of physical problems on a solid state disk. Because as far as a solid state disk is concerned, there is no such thing as defrag or contiguous space. It will move stuff around on its own to keep itself alive longer. Solid state disks, depending on what model and chip you're using, have a limit of 100,000 writes before the cell will die. And then as you move to higher end chips that store more data, when you're getting to like 32 gigs and 64 gigs, they will move to MLCs or what's called triple bit. And in the process of doing this, it will decrease the amount of life that you have tenfold or 20-fold. So depending upon that, you're looking at a 10,000 write span or a 5,000 write span. So it will gradually destroy itself much faster the larger your disk is. So those things are detrimental to this process. And so in case any of you don't know what we're talking about, that's the actual item, and it will physically destroy this disk if you did not have something called wear leveling. So in the process of doing this, the two fight against each other. If you defrag a disk or you do something with it, it's going to eat this disk faster. <clears throat> so along the way, Microsoft says, all right, we have some phones that we have made that are solid state, and we have an operating system running on them, Windows CE, or you know, many of you might have known them as variations of Windows phones and other pieces of equipment. Well, along the way, it was killing these things. So in the developers conference in 2006, Microsoft released Windows CE 6.0, and in that, they released a new version of XFAT, basically. That's the beginning of XFAT, so that we could try to make our devices live longer. But after that, and this is what they were telling everybody, this XFAT is awesome, it's great, everybody needs this, and just replace it in all your devices, and your stuff will live longer, and we'll be all happy. So as time went on, they threw a party, and nobody came. So in 2008, they thought, wow, this is awesome. Uh, nobody came. They were still all alone. So this is because everybody was over at the Linux party, or so Microsoft thinks. They are always, oh, Linux, Linux is eating us alive, whatever, I don't know. I don't know if they're really saying that, but you know the constant fights. So anyway, so Microsoft decides, hey, let's start suing people and see if we can win, because now we have not been protecting fat very well, 
but we would like to use our new technology XFAT. So there's all these principles with regards to you know, violations of, of people using your components and not being protected that you don't have a right to. So they start suing people. And of course, TomTom, Tom, a lot of people might remember this battle with TomTom, Tom, which technically they won, never went to court. They kind of just threw in the towel. So Microsoft starts going after embedded devices. Uh, most people don't realize maybe that there's a camera over in the corner. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> So what is the difference between a camera and a camcorder? Anybody have an idea? I have a... What is it? Next. I heard software. I heard... Firmware. Firmware. No, not necessarily. Not the body style. That's actually like a secondary aspect of why. What? No, not that. No? That's it, 30 minute record time. <laughs> Woo, here you go. I hope it's the right size. If not, give it to a friend. <laughs> it's 30 minute record time. So the reason is, is that any camera that records longer than 29 minutes and 55 seconds under UE law, there is EU law, uh, there is a tax. And right now I believe it is 14%. So if you import a camera into the European Union, you have an additional 14% tax if you record video longer than 30 minutes. That is the actual difference. It's not all this other crap where they say your camera can't you know, record because the sensor's gonna blow out or some bullshit like that. Because I've seen all kinds of comments, ridiculous comments. It's all because of this 14% tax which causes them to go through the roof for what essentially is exactly the same device. But a lot of the video cameras obviously use hard drives and things like that for a larger amount of space in order to record to because at high definition, they're eating a tremendous amount of space. And so this is one of the possible future advantages for XFAT where exceeding something like two terabyte might be a very useful thing uh, since we have a two terabyte limit, which we'll talk about shortly. But at least at this point in time, that's, the, that's one of the biggest things is dealing with this tax problem. So what happened is, as Microsoft is going after embedded devices in 2008, 2009, they convinced the SD Card Association that we are the standard. So you've been using FAT all this time, FAT and FAT32, so let's go ahead and replace what you're currently using. So in 2009, the SD Card Association says anything that uses more than 65,365 blocks is going to be required to be XFAT by definition or does not support it in the standard uh, SD Card 3.01 or 2.01 at this point. So, so basically, anything going forward, it is required to be XFAT according to their association which if you don't kind of get where that goes, it's for every device that exists because all other memory cards, I mean, let's face it, Sony's memory card. <sighs> Who's using that? Like six people? Uh, it's people who are driven by Sony at least from that standpoint. But there's just not that much out there that's using anything else but SD or compact flash. So Microsoft decides right afterwards to make this announcement. We are licensing XFAT and people who really want to use this you can pay us a $300,000 licensing fee and put it on your device. And so that was how they started. At the end of 2009, 2010, they started selling to device manufacturers. And so this is recent, in case people don't realize this. Uh, this was just a couple of months ago. RIM is now paying for XFAT. For what? Who knows? But people think it's extortion, right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, they might need it. Yeah, right. We've got so much extra cash. We'll just Anyway, it's probably for licensing reasons. Just a couple weeks ago, they signed BMW. Now, that's car. Um, anyway, however they're using it, they're using it. So, so as you go down this list, you will now find that since 2009, there have been 1,100 vendors that have signed up. More than 1,100 vendors. So that's $330 million that has been passed on to Microsoft just to use XFAT. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, so the ones that are MacBooks and laptops and things like that, that are actually an operating system or a physical device that is running an operating system, will also have volume licensing content as well. So they have a completely different agreement for, say, a MacBook for them to have volume licensing uh, as opposed to, and there's a great chance that number could be much larger than 300,000, right? So they're doing it per off by, and I'd, yes, sir? Whoever buys the license. 
So, and, and I'll get a little bit into the operating systems and how it's formatted and what actually happens, but, uh, but basically your camera will format in this particular instance that I'm talking about your device directly. Or if you have an embedded device, it will format it internally. But the theory was you could put it in a MacBook or a Windows machine because Windows could not format a 32 gig or bigger partition. So therefore, if you can format it in a Windows machine, then you can put it in your camera and use it, which I will show that it doesn't work. Uh, so anyway, this is kind of the direction where everything's been going. Now, this is a post that somebody made, which is the easiest and shortest explanation that I've seen this whole time, because the next argument is, what about Linux and Android? Because fine, you know, Apple can pay and Microsoft can pay, or, you know, obviously they have it, so who cares? Uh, but Microsoft released this, blah, blah, blah. They're going to exert their patents, and basically this is going to cause anybody who's trying to implement any kind of open source driver or anything along the way to actually have problems because there is the, the content is so complex and the layout for the way that XFAT actually works has a bunch of really nice features in it, like for instance, multiple time zones. So when your camera's traveling, you can tell the original time zone, the GMT time zone, you can tell exactly where things go. It also stores now, instead of, you know, like our cameras have been compensating for things, like you take a photo, it'll put the GPS coordinates in the photo uh, physically inside of the XIF information. Well, now you can actually store it inside of the file system. So the file system will actually track that as an attribute with the content if the device supports it. So there are ways for device manufacturers to use embedded content that is actually valuable inside of the file system itself. So forensics people, which is the point of this topic, is that uh, if you have GPS coordinates in your file system, this eliminates that problem we always have, which is did he change his time zone on his computer when he went to XYZ? And so physically we only have one and we have to try to figure out where he's at or look at shadows in photos so we can figure out what time it was, things like that. We have all kinds of weird stuff people have been doing. Supposedly now if you have GPS, you can tell. So this is going to get overly complex, obviously, for Linux, Android, things along that line. <clears throat> so, so at the end of 2000, 2009 and then in 2010 you start seeing this, Android gains its first SDX, say, from Microsoft patent threats. Do you know how they did it? Anybody guess? They paid Microsoft. So this is the interview with the guy who started Tuxera. So he basically says, yes, we paid them something. And uh, so we are, we are at the beginning of this curve. And then he turns around and says, OK, fine, blah, blah, blah. Anybody who's using embedded Linux devices, we have been cooperating with Microsoft. And so we're working into the future here because everybody's going to have an SDXE card at some point in time because 32 gigs is just not enough. So that's what he says. And then continuing on from there, basically saying, okay, here's the real problem. Any other time that you wanted to get a deal with Microsoft, you just go to Microsoft and get the deal. Well, in this case, you gotta go to Tuxera, or in theory, go to Tuxera, and then go to Microsoft as well. So you get a double tax in this process. And so physically, there is some sort of a, a piece of that. And then just a couple of days ago, a dude released an open file system so that you can use it in, in Fuse, which obviously then you can load it yourself. It's not going to come embedded in, a, in an operating system. But there's a lot of other things that physically happen if you can't embed it in your operating system. But he says, you know, fine, I wrote this. It's great. It's awesome. And I don't live in America, so screw Microsoft. And you guys can go find out yourself if you uh, are breaking the law or not. But I don't expect anytime soon, obviously, to see this release like in, you know, Ubuntu or something like that right out of the box. And part of the other problem is, is that Microsoft's not going to release some of the code and some of the, some of the patent issues with regards to that. They have not even opened this up, even for people who are paying for the license, aren't getting all the content currently about what all the variations are. So, so basically, here's the point. If we're switching to XFAT, what are our advantages? So, they give us a nice long list. There's a really long list, actually, much longer than this. I'm just going to attack a couple of these, actually. Uh, reduces your system footprint. So when you format something, you're not losing as much space. It's kind of a, a pay later kind of deal. You start out small, but then you pay later, and it grows. Uh, <clears throat> enables capacities larger than 32 gigs, which is pretty much the point. And then oper interoperability with other operating systems. Uh, you can feel that one coming and then removes the previous file system limit of four gigs and then makes it faster for solid state drives. So problems with XFAT. So as I'm doing this kind of content and I'm, I'm looking at cards now, I'm going, sticking them in the holes, pulling them out, examining them, trying to figure out what's going on. There's a couple of kind of amazing things. So again, the MBR. So when you're looking at 
a hard drive. This is what an MBR looks like. This is your master boot record. If you format a hard drive and you have a master boot record on your drive, you will still see some really common stuff that's going to exist on all of them. So, as you look, you'll see your standard stuff in an MBR would have been the, fi the, flag, the file system flag at the bottom, which actually says, I have partitions. Look for partitions and mount these partitions. And this is basically the flag that says, if you've, har if you've formatted a hard drive before in Windows and you've uh, brought up the disk management system. In the left-hand side, prior to formatting it, you'll actually see like a red circle on the initialize parameter. That means I have no MBR. Well, the thing that signals that you have an MBR is 55AA right here at the end. And so physically, that will then cause Windows to then search for partitions. Your partition structure actually exists right here at the bottom, and then you have your boot information above that. So this would be your standard MBR. Now, <clears throat> when you're dealing with an MBR, what does it limit us to? Four primary partitions. In, in a camera, do we care how many partitions? Probably not, no. So next, what's the next thing it limits us to? Well, actually it's like 72 secondary partitions, but that's irrelevant at this point too. What? Uh, not under 32 gigs, because we already have drives that we can format in FAT32 larger than 32 gigs, just not in Windows, right? So. Two terabytes. So, <laughs> this is a ice scraper or a paddle, whichever you want to use it for. <laughs> so, it limits us to two terabyte partitions, which again, as I mentioned earlier, in video cameras, wouldn't it be nice if we're going to store high definition? quality video beyond two terabytes, because at some point in time we're going to need it, we now at least have three and four terabytes that we could possibly use in a camera in a single device if we wanted to. Cameras have compensated for this before because Sony came up with a method of actually breaking up the video into two gig chunks so that you, they will be appended together when you're working on the video instead of having one large video, blah, blah, blah. But uh, So it's not even necessary at this point. It's kind of like you came to the game about 10 years too late because they solved this problem already by having another method with dealing with this. But it is still ironic that every other uh, operating system slash file system can format 32 gigs, uh, larger than 32 gigs in FAT32. We're just limited only in Windows systems, which again is the driving force to, hey, SD Card Association, you've been using our stuff for this long. So that's one of the first things that limits us back to this, this function. But part of the other problem is, is that we have this new structure that's been around again even before we had XFAT because, or at least availability, because it came out about the same time in 2006, 2005, uh, Intel and a couple other manufacturers worked on a GUID partition structure, so we could finally grow beyond this. Now, Macs have used the GUID partition structure since 2006, but, you know, we're gradually getting into that with Windows systems, where a bunch of them over the last two years have gone to UEFI and then finally gotten rid of this, and there's a whole other body that takes care of the GUID partition structure so that Intel isn't the owner of this particular thing, which, believe it or not, they sold licenses originally back in the day, version 1.0. So again, this is one of those things where it's not supposed to be tied. You can use XFAT regardless of your partition structure. You're supposed to be able to use a GUID partition structure so you can get past these other limitations. But Microsoft, in 2009, when they're trying to figure out a way to sell this to the SD Card Association, had to kind of bastardize XFAT in order to make it work and stay with the MBR and clean some things out, and it does not currently work, at least on the cameras, with a GUID partition structure. And the GUID partition structure has a couple of unique things that define it, and Microsoft kind of just ignores those because we're not using that on this camera, and just says, okay, fine, we're just going to leave that alone, just use an MBR again, and then we'll just compensate for the things that would have been a GUID partition table. And so... Uh, so even though it's not supposed to be tied to it, what you'll see is that everything in the MBR above here, because XFAT is not really a bootable system, it's not supposed to be bootable, it's for embedded devices, so there's no bootstrap loaders or any of this other stuff that would actually be valuable uh, to your machine when you were actually doing it as a boot drive or anything along those lines. So you'll still see their partition structure that will still exist here, and you will see the physical 55AA as usual. The funny thing is, even in GPT, when you're physically in the GPT, you'll see that there is some redundancy in your GPT structure for your partition tables, and typically it's not going to be smaller than about 100 megs. 
but generally you're looking at up to 200 megs, according to some of the standards, that it would actually take as far as disk space on your drive if you were using GPT. But there's this one right here at the top. This is the important part. There's a protective MBR section. So in other words, even if you're using GPT, they left the MBR alone just in case something wrote to it. They're not supposed to use it. They just ignore it, and it'll just be there. But the GPT structure still requires 55AA to be in the MBR, even though the MBR is a single sector failure and it's not supposed to be used. So another one of these ironic kind of weird things that's not necessary, but that's how Windows will actually load your partition structures. So you'll still see this in the camera, looking at your, your MBR and your partition structures, but the rest of it will be blank. So immediately when you come in, the first sector is gonna look blank until you scroll down to the bottom and you look at the bottom of the 512. But here's one of the reasons why, obviously, uh, not to mention the fact licensing issues. If you go and you say to your camera manufacturer, okay, now instead of just using FAT32, here's another piece of code, and you're gonna have to do all these complex things. You got dudes who are not probably great at writing code for cameras. They've been using the same process for a decade. So now you're giving them a very complex piece of code and say, we've changed the way XFAT works for everything, and you've gotta follow these chains, and you've gotta make sure it's contiguous, and you have all these other things. So the cameras didn't do a lot of physical work. When you, know, you turn them off, they're done. When you write something, they just slam it to the disk and then they turn off and they're done. They're not doing wear leveling and all these other functions easily uh, during the process of using your camera because they're not even alive in some cases. You're popping uh, batteries out and changing cards and doing all kinds of things. <clears throat> so, so that was one of the biggest deals as I was looking at it. Okay, so this is the beginning of the structure. Then what happens? What, is, what follows this? After this, there is a 16 meg partition. So here's the thing, on a hard drive, the reason that you would be using XFAT is that it would have a smaller footprint. This is one of the big selling points to Microsoft. You got free space that you're losing in all these other operating systems because you're using different size clusters. Well, now in these file systems, you should have a much smaller footprint. So this is a two terabyte hard drive I formatted in, in NTFS and XFAT to show you the differences between the two. So in NTFS, when you first format and it's unused, it's 147 megs that's reserved space on this version of NTFS because there's different variations that will be a little bit smaller. Uh, and then XFAT for the same format of a two terabyte drive, 1.5 megs. So it's a much smaller space for a full two terabyte drive that has been formatted to use this space. But then when you turn around and you format it, and this right here is a 64 gig card, and I format that in the camera or something along those lines, you'll actually see 384K. So this is the actual number that the camera should use as a footprint. Now it will grow as it uses space on the disk. So you will actually get small incremental increases, uh, but it's still very small and what you would expect to be small. But then you put it in the camera and you format it, and this is what you see. So if you look at it and you plug this into your computer, and you've taken it out of the camera after you formatted it, this is what you're gonna see. And I'm like, 16 megs. Well, that's kind of strange that they've reserved 16 megs because if I formatted this in NTFS, for this size drive, it would only be eight megs. So the footprint now is larger in addition to the 384K. The footprint now is larger on the camera than it would have been if it had just been NTFS or some other variation of something else. Uh, and so now I'm, now I'm concerned, I'm like, well, what about the 16 megs? What is there? Because also in the GUID partition structure, there's not even supposed to be this blank space. So they're kind of violating that one if that was the case, but it's just unallocated space. So I'll start looking at it and I say, well, what happens if I get rid of this partition and the camera says it's not there? Because my idea was I could put this in my Windows machine and I can format it and put it in this disk. Now, Microsoft has gone back even though they did a service pack for XP and then they said they were done and it sunsetted, they're not gonna do it again, they went ahead and they made one for Windows XP. So Windows XP has an XFAT driver that has already been done, you just load it and it's done, you can now read XFAT natively inside of your file system. So anything from XP all the way forward, all the server line and everything else has already been done. And then you know Microsoft and Apple are in bed, there's a whole bunch of things going on there with you know, iPhones and other stuff. So Apple, since 2010, has added in an XFAT driver. Most people don't even notice it's there. When you go to format something now, you'll see XFAT as one of the choices. So if you put a memory stick in, you'll actually see XFAT as a choice for formatting it. So they've already gotten it on, on Macs. So now Macs and all of Windows, at least current versions, are covered. 
So then that just leaves Linux to deal with. So following this, I formatted. Now, the other thing is too, the partition's reserved. You gotta get rid of it. This is the commands for getting rid of the partition structure uh, if you're using Windows 7 or Windows 8. <clears throat> so you just go and blow away it. Wait, any of the configuration information? <clears throat> and it'll start clean. So I blew it away, and then I formatted it in the Windows system and made a single partition in Windows 7. Then I took the card out, and I put it in the camera. So formatting this in Windows did not work at all. So this is when I start doing all the tests to see what actually happens with the code. How much of my space am I losing in the process of doing this? <clears throat> so I went to go look at the spec for the SD Card Association's content. Now there's a version four formatter as well at this point. So I've used these different formatters that the SD Card Association actually took Microsoft's code, built a formatter. The formatter will determine if it's 32 gigs and below, it'll automatically do FAT32 on its own. And if it's 64, if it's up to 64 gig or 32 gigs and higher, it will automatically format it as XFAT on its own. So you don't get a choice, it'll just do it. So you get this tool, then it's running in the background there, but I just went ahead and killed it, cleaned it, then I took this tool, I formatted it, and this is what the SD Card Association's formatter does. So that's the actual layout of the content again. So 16 megs of unallocated, unused space. Now in forensics, most people are like, anytime there's a partition gap and there's extra content, it's one more thing to look at. So in other words, you've got to, you take your partition, <clears throat> and since this is a new file system, a lot of our older tools, at least you know, anything that we haven't updated, won't work at all on the file system. So most of the tools, what you would do is you would normally take the partition, you would then you know, image the partition and examine the partition by itself. So you would use a tool that would recognize that partition structure. Then you'd look at all the unallocated space and everything else separately, carve it, do whatever. So in this case, you'll actually have to treat this as two different processes for it to normally work because some of our older tools don't work and they're slow to update. And obviously in case and a bunch of others have updated so it's not a problem for those things. But you still have to look at this unallocated space because what is in that 16 megs? So I also am gonna point out that there's also an option button here, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So I tested, I actually tested somewhere near 30 cameras, and I got various results and stuff that were just completely inaccurate. Sometimes it didn't work, it didn't format the card right, different things didn't work, and it, and it almost seemed like as I was testing more of these, especially point and shoot cameras, because point and shoot cameras now support them in many cases as well. So you've got point and shoot all the way up to your high-end cameras, your professional cameras that would even have, in some cases, dual slots and a couple of things you could play with. So from the low end, all of them looked like they were doing kind of the same thing. They were just trying to format something and then just slam it down on the disk and they weren't doing anything special. And then the higher end cameras would do a little bit better. But so I've listed 14 of the cameras that I tried here. 12 of them failed right away if it was formatted in a window system, which I thought was the point of being able to do XFAT on the camera in the first place, that you could just format it in a window system. So they will see it fine if it is formatted in the camera, and then you plug it into your Windows machine, you're able to actually copy your data and do something with it as well. But only two of the cameras out of all of my tests, so the Canon and the Sony, and other versions of the Canon did not work. Other versions of Canon's own line did not work. The previous camera I showed you, the picture from was also a Canon. Those did not work. Uh, only these worked in those tests. And so, <clears throat> now this is, this is not uh, an easy answer. What would the 16 meg partition be for? I don't know anybody can actually answer this easily because none of us can answer it. That's really the problem. This is the trivia question where no one, even included in the spec as best we can tell, we have no idea what the 16 meg partition is supposedly for. There is no, there's no description of why you know, SanDisk or any of the other manufacturers are formatting and leaving this. There's nothing in the SD Card Association that seems to indicate what the 16 megs is for. However, when I format it in GPT and then I put it in the camera, it doesn't work. It doesn't, like if I reformat the disk and I don't do a low-level format, it will leave all of the content in the 16 megs that was previously there. So I could make a partition, a 16 meg partition put content in the partition live in my operating system, and then format it in the camera, and it will leave whatever is there for that 16 megs. And this is the header for the EFI partition structure and the other content that would be there for UEFI and GPT and things that are there. Now, this is only 16 megs of space, which it should be 100 megs, so 
it would be overriding the tail end or whatever else was there. So maybe getting rid of some redundancy, but it had the beginning of the table. And so I found this kind of very unusual from that standpoint. Uh, the cluster and the location for where it would begin is a very weird offset as well for where the partition structure begins for the standard uh, XFAT partition. Yeah, somebody asking a question? No, good. Uh, so this is what the SD Card Association's formatter does. There is a button there, and the button says Format Size Adjustment. And you click on it, and it just says On or Off. And you'll see it on the line below it where it says Format Size Adjustment. They don't have an explanation in here. So I went and I pulled it from the manual. This is what they say. If the formatted capacity of the card is not a multiple of the capacity of the cylinder, some hosts may not recognize this card successfully. So we're back to the old, ancient, 1982 MBR slash partition structure cylinder component that I talked about earlier. So it's a calculation of the cylinder component. So if you format it, it doesn't work in your system, you're supposed to go back and reformat it and click this button, and then it will then be on the cylinder boundary so that your system can find the partition correctly. So again, I was a little, like, there's just a whole list of these kind of things that every time I test something, it just keeps going on and on and on. There's another, yeah. So it's a mathematical calculation. It's not, there's not an actual cylinder since we moved to LBA blocks. When we went to logical block addresses for sectors after eight gigs, then, uh, then following that, we did not have to stick with the partition structure that we have. They only did it because if Norton Utilities existed on the computer, it would automatically change it and ruin the disk. So, so they physically have a calculation from the beginning of time uh, for what those cylinder boundaries should always be. Until Vista. When they released Vista, they said, and, you know, and nobody noticed because those six people are not complaining that their systems aren't running right. But, uh, but now Windows 7, Windows 8, they continue on with this, with this process. So, uh, so a cylinder is just a calculation. There are some tools that will show it to you very easily, like Test Disk is one of them. If you try to run that, it'll actually, it'll ask you a question. It'll say, would you like to do, are you running Windows 7, or are you running Windows 8 or Vista or whatever? And if you say yes, it'll search every single sector for a partition. If you say no, it has uh, 1,024 sectors that it actually checks for cylinder partition boundaries. Okay, so, and you'll see that in other tools. What they'll say is when you search for a partition structure or a file system structure, they'll say, do you want to do an excessive search? If you do an excessive search, it touches every single sector on the entire drive. If you don't, it does it by calculations and it's done in about 10 seconds. So that's what it is on an SD card as well. So, now there's one other thing, the dirty bit. Some people talk about this in NTFS, so if you're doing forensics, you're used to hearing about this. In the volume header information, there is something called a dirty bit. If the computer crashed, then it would look at file records and it would back out transactions. So it would cause scan disk to kick off. And so physically in NTFS, if your system crashes, that would be what would happen. So when you're looking at XFAT, this is the structure and the basic information for that. There's a volume header information. And in the volume header information, there is also a dirty bit that uh, doesn't exist in you know, the standard FAT or in the way that this exists in the standard FAT tables. So if you play with the dirty bit and you mess with the numbers that affect the dirty bit, in Windows, what you would see is this. Hey, my camera might have something screwed up on this card, blah, 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 I'm gonna scan it, and I'm gonna try to fix any things that are not allocated correctly. And so, this is one of those more complex pieces of code that's sitting inside of our Windows systems that would try to do this. But the camera would do absolutely nothing. So if the dirty bit happens, something bad happened to it, they're not filling out the tables, they're not following fat chains, they're not doing anything. All they are doing is slamming a picture down on a disk and updating one table, and that's it. No complexity there whatsoever. So if you had some corruption, they would have no idea. And this is happening a lot. People who are you know, professional photographers are having pictures that are coming off corrupt because the code isn't running correctly. And so this is actually on Lexar's website. They actually physically posted this about their memory sticks. So this is what Lexar says. Deleting images on a camera is convenient, but at the same time can result in data corruption, especially with large file formats, raw and TIFF, Move and save the images using your computer and then utilize the editing software that came with the camera and third-party applications for more flexibility, blah, blah, blah. Processing on the camera is a light operation, so do not, basically do not delete an image using the camera. Turn around and delete it on when you're physically plugged into a computer. 
And this is where most of the problems have happened where people are looking at the camera, they delete a picture, they're deleting 12 or 15 pictures, the update isn't done correctly, there's no chains that are actually followed because there's no fat, there's actually a definition for am I contiguous or am I not. And they're not following it at all. So when they go to fill in something or do something, the camera's corrupting the memory. And when you put it back in your machine, it's not gonna work correctly. So just understand, now we're in a realm where we cannot use the delete function or edit functions on our camera without having some sort of a detrimental effect to our pictures. Yes, sir? Always reformat it in the camera, in the camera, and, and never ever delete a picture or use it on the, on the device itself. Go ahead and do it, right, and that's from Canon. That was a Canon guy, which also, we've got some experience with Canon, and I'm just gonna tell you, it's crap. Their code, right now, everybody's using crap code for all of these things. So anyway, this is the really short version, like how did, they, how did they deal with this? Well, right now, file system overhead is not smaller because they have the 16 meg partition. Uh, it does increase beyond 32 gigs, but we have an MBR, so we're again limited to our two terabyte partition structure, which we could have gone, away, gone ahead and done away with. There was no need for us to do this at this point. Uh, and then we already could handle more than 1,000. They actually tout this as a feature inside of XFAT that we can have more than 1,000 files in a single directory. FAT32 could do 35K, so 65K. So somehow that wasn't enough for pictures. I don't know why. Uh, it does speed up storage allocation. Uh, it does have optimizations for solid state, so that is much faster. And then it does remove the four gig limit, but in cameras, how many pictures do we have that are four gigs? Maybe for future stuff, obviously, it's important, but not for this. And then uh, operator, anything having to do with operating systems, yeah, it is, it is much more flexible, but we're also talking about $300,000. Yes, sir? Do you know, did you do any testing with any of the alternate firmwares, like the Canon Hacker Bell for the kids? I didn't do anything with the hacking because I actually walked into stores and did these things, and I bought two cameras and tested the two in my hand, and then my friend in Australia had several himself. But, uh, in, you know, to take a professional high-end $7,000 camera and then write a, a hacked firmware to it, wasn't really a good idea, especially for him. Uh, I just wonder if they've implemented any different implementations of file system. You know, this, uh, there are some ways to format an, an, X, an SD XE card as FAT32 and then use it in the camera. The camera will still write content to it, but uh, by default it may also fail. So in these other cards it may fail, but I did not try any of the hacked firmware yet. Some of them couldn't load them at the time. I actually looked to see and nobody could load them at the time. So there was variations in those kind of things. Uh, and then there is a whole bunch of, uh, you know, things that we can add into the file system, GPS coordinates and things like that, which are really helpful. But uh, we already had XIF. We made that up years ago to take care of some of those problems. So we already have that kind of stuff. So, so really, this is the big problem you want to pay attention to if you're a professional photographer and you're using cameras and doing something right now. There's, there's peers that Microsoft just sold you a license, and it's up to you to implement it and figure out if your shit works. They didn't do anything to validate and say, okay, well, XFAT is a good thing. So there is no validation process currently. It physically is just garbage. And so again, no standards, no whatever, and we're living with the consequences of all that. And then we have all of these legacy things that we're having to deal with that should be gone at this point. And of course, on video cameras, we don't wanna live with our two terabyte partition problem. So, uh, so again, if you have a camera that supports XFAT, which most of you do, since they are all been made since 2010, and then your future items are gonna be your tablets and your Androids are gonna to wanna to be able to use an XFAT card because they want 64 gigs. There actually will probably be licensing requirements by the SD Card Association to force them to do it. You know, they can't just buy a card reader and stick it in. You know, your free versions of your operating systems is a real problem because they're not gonna release code under the GPL or any of the other things to make this happen. So that's what I got for you. I'm Scott Moulton, thank you. Yeah, uh, so why isn't there a push for any other file systems? You know, why isn't ZFS on our camera or something like that? Again, my guess is money, right? Microsoft goes to the card association, they say, I don't care what it takes, here's some money, put this as your next standard. We are already using FAT, FAT and FAT32, and we did that for free, and now we're gonna sue you, or something like that, which I assume is what happened to RIM. Um, I don't know for sure, so don't quote me on that, but I'm assuming that there is some sort of patent violation stuff they're threatening them with, and Have I found a case where what? Uh, so 
so far, the question is that I find for interesting information in the file system that was not in the XF, the XF information? Uh, so far, no, not in, uh, not in any of the cameras that have been out there for forensics cases. I get them for data recovery cases. They don't even know how to use them at this point. So this is all future awareness stuff that's actually about to happen because that, six, that 16 meg partition is really a problem because you can put stuff there, hide it in your camera, keep reformatting it in the camera. No one's going to look. No one's going to see it. And if you're going through TSA and they're looking at your camera, that 16 meg partition, unless they pull it out and do something with it, they're never going to see it either. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so do I see a difference between CF and SD cards? Um, CF actually has an ATA spec, so they're treated as a hard drive, which no other memory card is treated that way. So CF cards have an ATA5 spec, which they can actually plug in through an IDE controller and treat as a hard drive. Uh, currently cameras, at least you know, as you're heading into the higher end stuff, I haven't seen a move for CF yet, or at least going in this direction, uh, with larger cards yet. So as soon as they do and they go to a larger card, I'm assuming the camera's also going to format those as, as XFAT. But I don't know the answer to that part of the question yet. But since they're supported by ATA specs, it's unnecessary. They actually treat them as a hard drive. So there's a bunch of things we can do differently. So that's it. Thank you.